Thank you, Mia, um, and thank you, Strauss and Co., and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to today be speaking about three works in particular of Irma Stern, um, and I suppose what I'm going to attempt to do is to trace, I suppose, a line of, sort of Irma's psychological development through her pictures, and I suppose what we're doing is... Um, in terms of in terms of a, a reading, we're doing a a, a, a reading of exegesis um, as opposed to eisegesis. Eisegesis meaning that the meaning is contained within the text, and exegesis is when we bring biographical information to bear on the on the on the image itself. Um, and I suppose use these images in order to take something away from the image, being able to contextualize these, uh, these works in the broader socio-political and socio-economic sphere in which they were produced. Um, and I suppose I've started with these two images on the front, um, just to, um, uh, on our front page, just um, as an illustration of this, uh, to place Irma in, in context and to, to, place, um, to place Irma, to, to, to aid in our understanding of who Irma was. And I think very much, we we need to remember that these pictures are and 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 are a product of their time as well as much as Irma was a product of her time. Born to Jewish um, Jewish immigrants um, in uh, the trans then Transvaal town of um, Schwitz Um she was born to a German Jew Jewish immigrants, um, and as a consequence, she. Um, traveled uh, quite prodigiously um, in both her early life um, to, to and from Europe. Um, and and um, then in a, in a, and obviously these, these travels were curtailed by um, the two world wars um, and which then saw, saw Stern having to look for new avenues um, and, and new subject matters. Um, and, then, and then we see her um, again, returning to Europe after um, both in, both in between World War One and uh, World War Two, um, and uh, and then um, again after um, World War Two, we see her making quite a big entry onto the European stage um, for for what would um, for for I suppose mapping mapping what would uh, define the the future of her career. So these these pictures tell that story. I suppose it. The, the, the pictures tell the story of um, of this European travel as well as African travel, um, and uh, and and really I suppose allow us to to orientate Irma Stern as uh, as I said as um, symptomatic of some of the prejudices of her time and some of the popular beliefs of her time, um, and and I think just give us a give us a, a fuller picture of the the nuanced development that um, Stern would make as an artist. Um, so the three pictures um, and, and, and the picture, the, the portrait on the right um, is, 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 I chose very specifically because it was taken in 1927. Um, and that, this portrait um, of, a, of, a, of a, a very young Irma Stern was um, the same time that she painted, um, well, this was Irma when she painted our first picture. So just to speak about the pictures that we're going to be talking about, we've got um, the Swazi woman, um, set to painted in 1927. We've got this um, uh, this Arab woman, um, which was painted on her second trip to Zanzibar um, in 1945, um, towards the end of uh, World War II, and then we're coming to the Grand Venetian um, Canal, um, which she painted um, not long after 45 and painted in 1948, um, which speaks to, I suppose, as we as we will talk about later, both a renewed period of internationalization for not only Europe, but um, for Stern as well, who was um, now returning after this um, after this 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 um, period of, of um, sort of self-imposed exile from a, a war torn a war torn Europe. So, as I mentioned, um, the picture that we're looking at here, this was Irma in the year that she painted our Swazi sitter, um, and I suppose this is a good opportunity to to speak about. I suppose the 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 nuances with which she brings this picture and uh, as i said you know just as a, a point of methodology i'm going to be using some some biographical details to sort of further understand stern's stern's views and and sort of 
position at the time at the time of this um, painting's execution. And I think that finding a picture um, of of Stern at the age when she painted this work, I think brings some sort of bearing of of um, of, of real life um, to to the picture. And we can understand the picture not necessarily as a as a product, but um, an intimate part of the of the universe that um, that that Stern is uh, depicting around her and uh, the universe of her collective experiences that um, that the paintings can be seen to represent. So Stern traveled a number of times um, to to Swaziland, um, and uh, during during these trips, um, she. Uh, would endeavor to um, endeavor to to um, paint a, paint paint the, the people that she that she that she came across. Um, uh, she, I think her first trip was in 1924, um, again in 1926, uh, and then again in 1927. Now these these Swazi trips um, were were some of the some of the sort of further flung. Um, journeys that she had taken. We know that she traveled to Mgababa um, in the, the South KwaZulu Natal coast, um, as well as Pondo land, um, and um, as well as um, the sort of the, the areas around the, the, the trans sky and the interior. So, you know, this was, um, I suppose, very much to be also understood and contextualized against the Against the background of her of her itinerant schooling um, in Europe and at the hands of the European avant-garde movements um, of the German expressionists that she was exposed to at the early at the at the outset of the of the 20th century. So, um, w when she um, when with the family going to and from to and from Europe, um, she she um, settled settled at the beginning of the 20s. Um, well, I think it was 1917 through to 1920, 1920. Um, and there, um, Irma was um, uh, made friends with um, Max Pechstein and um, the, the the was exposed to the the avant-garde um, developments in painting um, of the of, of German expressionism. And I think these works are a great debt to um, a debt to that kind of expressionistic color. Um, that that was um, developed uh, developed um, by by those 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 artists. Um, I suppose very much also um, if we're talking about sort of the European the European influence of uh, on her early work, we can also trace um, similar similar works um, uh, to to the likes of um, Paul Gagan um, with his uh, travels in uh, the Polynesian islands, um, but. The observation that I want to make, and I want to distinguish the a single Swazi sitter from 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 these works in particular, um, because I'm just going to try. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to make this um, a bit smaller so I can just make this screen less. There we go. Um, so what I want to do is I want to distinguish um, between between our our sitter and 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 these images largely because I suppose of the of the of the presiding view that um, although she would have come across scenes like this of which we'll give you some I'll give you some um, some historical some historical archival photographs um, that sort of be able to place figures like this in the landscape they very much are a result in in, in a caricatured stylized rendition that I think um, relies more on its graphic quality um, than it does on um, than it does on I suppose necessarily fidelitous observation um, and fidelity to to stern subject this was um, stern I suppose you can see an early stern grappling with um, how to render shape form and color and I think um, in in these in some of these early pictures, um, notably uh, repose, um, what happens is that the I suppose there's a certain kind of individuality um, of the of the sitters that is um, that is beautified and 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 suffers as a as a result. Um, just interestingly, in this um, in this in this work, um, 
we 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 notice um some of the some of the antecedents to um her still lives um that we we you note the lilies in the in the foreground and the exotic fruit trees um in the in in the background and the, this is sort of generally very lush jungle like um jungle like uh, uh environment in which uh, stern places the citizen however um the scenes and and um through through my research um we've gone um consulted the the swazi national um archives and the swazi national trust archives um and the the scenes that that stern would have um been been greeted with um as and you know these are the sort of as i said the sort of stylized results of such were more akin to these these are um young swazi women bathing in a river um and the, interestingly enough, um, these these archival archival photographs um, were were taken in ninety in between the years of nineteen twenty two and nineteen twenty five. Our work is um, placed in nineteen twenty seven. So we can see, I suppose, there's definitely there's definitely a, a, on the one hand a fidelitous relationship. Stern is not necessarily inventing anything, but I suppose in in these particular in 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 these early works. Um, we we are we are getting a sense of um, uh, sort of graphic stylization that I think um, begins. We we can see we can see a break um, coming uh, coming later, um, and uh, particularly in 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 our Swazi sitter. Now, when we come to the Swazi when we come to this particular Swazi sitter, there is embedded in the in the painting. Uh, a series of a series of visual clues and visual codes that um, that allow us more accurately to position this this individual um, in uh, as a um, in a consequence of her time and um, in, in a in a you know, gives us a very a very set idea or very set understanding of how old she was what her marital status was um, and um, you know, then furthermore, um, uh, to to account, and we can begin to account for the averted eyes um, in the gaze, which, as you'll note, I I I, I sort of made the made the postulation earlier that um, I think this reveals um, Stern's beginning of um, Stern's sort of psychologically nuanced portraits um, where. She creates this hermetic universe um, that that really the the the, the sitter embodies, and um, the sitter, um, I suppose, exists in a in a world separate to that of Stern. These are no longer characters in Stern's manifesto, or these are no longer these are no longer figures in in Stern's imagination, but they belong to a universe all of their own. Um, so, firstly. Just to just to begin on elaborating on some of the some of the visual the visual prompts that Stern uses um, in this work, um, and and I suppose just to elaborate on on some of the on some of the I suppose interesting as I mentioned earlier sort of social um, socio cultural and socio economic um, the signs in this and the, the the first thing obviously that we that we um, turn to is the red sash. Um, I think it's the first sort of. Um, first, most obvious uh, a signifier that we can begin that helps us beginning to unpack this this particular picture. Um, the red sash was very interesting for me because um, you know as a you know knowing that Irma Stern was in um, the Izulwini Valley in uh, the uh, October November of um, 1927, we can uh, we can most certainly locate this um, sitter as Swazi. But you know, how do we how do we go to understand the 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 other sort of more necessary um, visual prompts that uh, that 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 the sitter is talking to. The red sash, interestingly enough, was introduced by the Portuguese into the southern coast of Africa via um, uh, Mozambique or then Lorenzo Marx, um, and the Portuguese were trading this um, trading this well introduced this fabric um, into into um, the 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 east coast of of Africa. Um, I think importing it from India. In the late um, and that began, I think, in the late 17, towards the end of the 17th century, um, and then from these trading stations, um, uh, they would um, move, move. The traders would buy, buy these these fabrics and move um, inland. 
um, and obviously arriving in Swaziland or today as we shall refer to it as Eswatini. Um, the, the red fabric is also led us, led us to, to these different states of, um, to, to let us to begin to understand the different states of, of um, the way that this lady is clothed and what does this mean? Why are her breasts showing? Why are her, her eyes closed? And what is she, what is she revealing? And what does she not, not want to reveal at the same time? I think these are all important questions that we that we approach this picture with. And um, I think you'll agree with me that you know, with the 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 the, the withheld gaze, leads us to believe leads us to see something quite enigmatic happening in this uh, in this in the sitters. Um, Sort of psychological states and at the same time as I mentioned we're also going to use some of Irma Stern's own biographical information and own biographical writing to I suppose give a kind of idea um, as to uh, as to as to how we can how we can further further tell this tell this uh, sitter's tale and locate her within a time and a place and in the culture so firstly, um, I, I started, I started being very interested in, um, in, in Swazi ritual, because I think this is one of the first, um, the first places that we can, that we, that we should turn to, um, to, 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 to better understand um, what, uh, what, what state the sitter finds herself in. And I came to, I obviously started with one of the most, one of the most popular, um, Sort of rituals uh, of, of the of the Swazi, which is the Mkeswano ritual, um, which is today the modern day, which the the, the is the today the modern day reed dance. Um, but the Mkeswasho um, was a little bit more complicated um, than just uh, necessarily a king looking for a bride. Um, it was designed to protect younger women. It was designed to help younger women through the various developments of their body and uh, and and it it is um, commonly described as um, a chastity ritual um, that's uh, specific to 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 young women in order i suppose to protect their bodies um, as they as they arrive at the age where they are are, are ready to to find a suitor and um, ready to begin life as 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 married women um, so the Mkeshwa show ritual um, occurs um, between and, and the description, the sort of most common description that the, that we've found is that it's uh, the, the 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 young women are um, divided up into what's called age regiments. So we've got um, I think the ages of seven to nine, nine to thirteen, thirteen to fifteen. 15 to 17, 17 to 19, and 19 to 21. And at each one of these, um, at each one of these sort of turns, um, there's, uh, a, there's a, 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 series of, a series of circumstances um, and, a, and, a, and a new item of clothing that they can add that would signify their movement into, into um, uh, up, up, the, up the ladder, so to speak, um, as they, as they um, head towards uh, head towards ready for marriage. Um, so, what we can tell about this lady is that, um, well, this this um, this young Swazi woman is that she is between the ages, presumably of about nineteen and twenty-one. She um, is now eligible for marriage, and at the same time, um, she has had a proposal. Um, uh, she hasn't been married yet because um, uh, she is um, the sash. The sash um, is just over the shoulders, um, exposing her breast. Um, and when, by the time that she is married, then that sash would uh, that sash would be um, would 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 I suppose exemplify go to exemplify um, a, a, a status of her, her modesty. Now, as as I was mentioning earlier, one of the one of the principles. Um, Behind behind Stern's earlier um, portrayals of of Swazi subjects was the the overt stylization that occurs um, with uh, Stern, I suppose, um, you know, going the sort of 
the, the, the ethnographic roots of a sort of a colonial caricature, whereas I think we approach um, this, um, the, where we approach this picture um, with a far more quite serious meditation on, on the, 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 the premarital state of the, of the sitter. The beat in the left-hand side of her hair are, are red, and um, that suggests to us that um, the sitter is now at the age where she can be married, um, when she is eligible for, for to be betrothed. And um, as we mentioned, um, there's been, I've, I've been greatly conflicted trying to discover what the, what the object is on the other side of her head. Is it beads? Was it a flower? Was this just another example of Stern beautifying um, her, 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 her subjects and, and further exotifying, um, you know, the, the other, if you like, um, which is, I suppose, very much the, the, the standard, the standard academic approach to understanding the Mr. However, it's struck me when I was looking at this picture that I thought there's something, there's something more complicated going on. And I'm in the pictures that, in the pictures that I've looked at of her, Mr. I find very, uh, very often she's not making, she's not making anything up. Um, I, I find her quite faithful to, quite faithful to her sitters. Um, and, and so after, after a lot of, after a lot of searching, I came across this image. Um, now these are two young Swazi sitters. As I said, these ladies, um, the, 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 the one sitting down um, has in fact been married because her, her chest is covered. Um, and, uh, and in a sign of modesty. But here we can note um, the white beads um, in the hair. And, and that, led me to, that led me to postulate that, in fact, we're not looking at a flower at all, but we're looking at white beads um, in the hair, um, which are, are topped um, and, 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 and finished by um, sort of a slight black and red uh, uh, additions uh, in the in the bottom of the in the bottom of the hair, and you can see, uh, and this this image was from the this image was from the uh, 1930s, um, early 1930s. So it's slightly after after Stern um, uh, visited. Um, 1927 was in fact her last visit to Swaziland, um, but I think uh, you know definitely definitely places the um, definitely places the two sitters um, within within. You know, contingent similarity, um, and I think uh, that's helped me sort of understand a little bit further the the state of this woman, and and understands leads us also to understand the reason for um, these these eyes being closed and withdrawn. So, uh, my my suggestion is um, almost that in this instance, Stern is painting a sitter who occupies a world into which we are not invited. The, 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 the purpose of those white beads, as um, I suppose goes, is with the modern equivalent would be the engagement ring um, as, a, as, a, as a sign and a signifier to say to um, those who might, uh, those who might uh, catch her eye to say, I'm not for you. I'm not for the consumptive gaze of others. I'm already taken. I've already I've already prom I've already been betrothed or, or, or promised to another, um, and thus in this way for me Stern creates this quite dense psychological universe that um, that uh, in which the sitter occupies um, and that is full of these sort of embedded cultural rituals and signs that aren't necessarily immediately apparent and might not have even been to Stern, um, which is very interesting. But nevertheless allows us a historical record and a historical window into a time, both a time and a state of, of becoming and the state and journey into womanhood. Um, and it was, as I said earlier, it was very particular that I chose the, the, the portrait of Irma Stern, um, or the, the photograph of Irma Stern, because these two sisters would have probably almost been the same age. And 1927 was an important year, and you'll Note, on each one of these pictures that we'll go through to discuss represents specific times in Irma's life that were, if you like, turning points um, for, for uh, her own artistic development um, 
in in um in in in, in her in her sort of broader general career so as i mentioned um i was I, i'm i was hoping to to bring to bear some of irma's own personal biography um onto onto a reading of this uh, onto a reading of this image because i think it just adds a kind of adds a, a layered texture that um that 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 allows us i suppose not only to understand the sitter's state but also irma's internal motivations um, and internal turbulence um, that she was going through during the period that this that this portrait came into being. So, 1927, Irma, um, the the Second World War now has um, taken Europe, and Irma has been um, uh, you know forced to forced to return to South Africa, which she did at the beginning of the 1920s. Um, quite restless, and um, thus she traveled, as we mentioned earlier, to Pondoland and um, Gobaba on the, on the southern KwaZulu and South Coast, and um, then, uh, then now, um, you know, further is the field at that stage in her early life to, to, to Swaziland or Swatini, as it is um, today known. So, 1927, Irma had just been married. Um, she married uh, Johannes Prince, um, who, who she had met in Germany and was her tutor. Um, the marriage was by all, all intents and purposes um, arranged for her by her parents. Um, Irma was, I suppose, a, bit, a little, uh, yeah, sort of conflicted, conflicted by this um, because I don't think there was a, an immediate, there was an immediate um, connection or romance between, um, between Prince and herself. Um, and, uh, and I think it was, um, you know, even at the, the Cape Argus in May of 1927, um, reviewing one of her one of her exhibitions, referred to her, heaven forbid, as Mrs. Prince, um, which I think uh, she apparently um, very very quickly uh, attempted to put a stop to, because I think uh, Irma Stern um, was a was a, a valuable name was a valuable name to her um, and a, a valuable part of her own identity. But then what becomes more interesting um, is, uh, is when Stern, and at the beginning of this unhappy marriage, when Stern was her most, at her most happy. And she seems to be her most happy when she's traveling and when she's traveling and painting on these extended trips. And this is a kind of, and this, this notion of travel, this notion of wunderlust um, is something that pursue, or that, that, that shadows Stern through, through her career. She needed travel, um, and she needed these engagements with um, with 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 people that were unlike her, um, in order to satisfy the creative impulse and the creative drive that um, that 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 was really a, a, a sort of a consequence of her, of her work. So, more interestingly, um, we we get to we get to Irma's diaries um, and and letters um, that are, are um, that we're lucky to lucky to have. Um, in the in the in the text um, put together and edited by uh, Neville Debo, um, which is uh, titled Paradise: The Journals and Letters of Irma Stern between the years of 1917 and 1933. She was by by 1930 she was estranged from Johannes Prince, and by 1933 I think they were divorced. But there comes this vague biographical thread that uh, is just a it's just a fragment. But nevertheless, I think this 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 fragment of Sturm's, er, Irma's own love life that we can bring to, to bear on a reading of, uh, of this work. So, 1921, Zulwini in Swaziland, and um, she's, writing, she's writing to a friend of mine. She said, um, you guessed right, I'm in the middle of working. Um, I'm in love, just imagine. I would have never thought it that I would love again. Love is certainly something outside of one's control. There one is, an honest and respectable married woman with little pleasures from things like love. And suddenly one looks away and one becomes young again. And bang, one lands in the middle of it all. How long is this going to last? I do not know and I do not care. It's almost like being situated in between past and future. You will think, um, and she's talking to Trudy here, uh, you will think that your little strechen is crazy and you'd be right. Um, but it's wonderful nevertheless, even if it is the even if it is the only the harmony of a single day and it carries endless meaning for me the consciousness of another person in my loneliness so 
and then the fragment and then the fragment ends and we have got no lead and we 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 can't the, the that's that's where that's where that piece of biography ends which is for me fascinating because i think if you bring that to bear on the so this painting november that was written in november 1927 this painting was presumably produced around about the same time and here we have a sitter in love here we have a sitter closed off from the world insulated in her own romance and at the same time here we have stern in love married isolated from her husband happy being away and painting and on the fringes of our imagination and on the fringes of what we can perceptibly perceive from from the writing there comes this shadow of another person and this shadow of another world like the like the universe um that this sitter occupies um into which we aren't fully invited we only get the we only get this vague sense of this um of this of this of this notion of love so for me this this portrait sings deeply of a, a kind of a kind of inner inner romance both of the sitter and this uh, enigmatic fleeting affair um that uh, that is uh, i think under unexplored of of Hermes. so um i think uh, a, a deeply a deeply um a deeply challenging and uh, deeply moving picture um as i said um you, this picture was important this picture is important for me because it speaks to the kind of development that that stern would um that stern's work would see play um taking place um, later on in her career, and this was um, uh, a portrait in 1946, and I, I included this because you come of a of a Watusi woman, um, and and as I mentioned, travel becomes a very important itinerant part of her life, and so the, um, our Swazi woman was painted um, due to due to Stern's limitation on European travel because of World War One, and this Watusi woman was painted. Um, uh, as a consequence of Stern's restricted travel um, uh, due to World War II, um, when um, when she had to she had to pursue alternative alternative means and alternative destinations. And why I mention this, and why I wanted to include this picture is because I think Stern's portraits very often we um, very often we're familiar with um, uh, you know some of the some of the male portraits um, that she done particularly. Particularly of the period, like this of the Zanzibar um, pictures, um, you know, Stern would visit the Congo and Zanzibar between 1939 and 1946, um, and these have been sort of some of the, the defining images uh, from 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 that period. Um, uh, particularly this um, portrait of a Omani, um, a, 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 an Omani nobleman from the house of Said, who was the um, who was the the, 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 the the sultans of Zanzibar um, during this period? Um, uh, but it brings me then to this um, to this to this portrait that was um, painted on Stern's um, second uh, second trip um, to to Zanzibar in uh, in, in nineteen uh, in nineteen forty five. Um, now Stern Stern was for all intents and purposes a socialite. Um, she, she um, had, I suppose, um, had the advantage of um, a very sophisticated schooling. Um, she had grown up, um, albeit in, um, in, in this um, sort of, you know, with a, with a, with a, with a, a father that was a general trader. Um, and, uh, you know, in this, in this tiny then Transvaal town of Schritz Reinecke. But she had moved in between Germany and the Cape um, and, uh, and 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 South Africa, and um, I suppose had um, led this uh, led um, quite a quite a quite a sophisticated had 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 had, had the tastes of society. Um, so so on the journeys on the on on her two journeys to to Zanzibar, it almost it seems natural that Stern fell into fell into high society, um, and. So the one of the one of the important one of the important results of um, of the of the Zanzibar of the Zanzibar trip um, was that she would publish um, in 1948, which is also another very important date. She published her um, that we'll get to. She published her 
travelogues, um, uh, sort of an eponymous um, titled Zanzibar, Irma Stern Zanzibar, um, which is, uh, you can still see my picture, uh, it's, it's, it's up here, it's a bit of a, a, a linen bound um, text. And what's quite interesting is, um, is how she describes these these portraits of, um, of, 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 of women and, and specifically her relationship to what she would call termed the, the Arab um, or, or the Arabs. And so, um, and, and this, this brings, um, brings, this brings a lot to bear between the relationship, as I mentioned earlier, of Stern and her sitter. Um, and it really quite a, quite a unique relationship that um, to my mind is, um, is unrivaled. So, at the one time, you know, that there is a criticism that Stern leaves behind little evidence of any kind of solidified identity of her sitters. Nevertheless, I think there's an electric relationship that happens between sitter and subject, um, and that's evidenced in the in the gaze of these pictures. As I mentioned, um, the, the gaze of our Swazi sitter being averted, signaling, I'm not here for consumption, I'm not here to engage in you. But Again, as I said, we, we're taking some of um, uh, Stern's biographical um, data and biographical writing and, and bringing them to bear on the pictures can, I think, give us a, give us a, far, fuller, a far fuller understanding. So listen to Irma describing, um, to describing these kinds of relationships and describing this very room in which um, she would have found herself. And, um, and just also keep in the back of your mind about sort of Stern. Stern at this stage, 1947, had been divorced already for over a decade. She was traveling alone in Zanzibar, which in the 1940s was virtually unheard of. Uh, um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, a Caucasian woman uh, traveling in, in, you know, in, in these exotic places, uh, uncompanioned by, um, by a husband or, or man, um, you know, in the an otherwise very patriarchal society would have been would have something that would have been something that turned people's head. Um, so I think here we also can see um, sort of stern the feminist uh, uh, emerging, or or a stern with a very sort of strong idea of um, of of empowering women in these in these representations rather than making them necessarily objectifying them um, and objectifying the objectifying, uh, approaching them with an objectifying gaze. But again, just note, listen to Stern um, speaking about uh, this, this very room in which we're in. The Arab may marry two or more wives. The women do not count. They have no say in men's lives. They bring children into the world. They cook, they direct the servants, but they are of no consequence as the Arab believe that women have no souls. As I've mentioned before, um, also this is slightly reveals Stern being, uh, you know, subject to the prejudice of the, her time. Um, so, yeah, um, a woman may not enter a mosque to pray to Allah. They live in seclusion in a harem, in rooms on the top floor of the house. They sleep in huge, broad brass bedsteads now. The old beds carved lions' heads and feet. In these rooms are a multitude of Arab chests filled with their dowries of lovely old Eastern silks and heavy gold fringes, trousers wrenched at the ankles with the frills falling over their feet. Heavy perfumes hang in the air, expensive penetrating Eastern perfumes, the large mirrors and heavy golden frames coming down from the ceiling and decorated with arabesques and crests are gifts from the Sultan. The rooms are laid out with mats over old dark red tiles. Persian mats, and straw matting with viv in vivid array. In front of the bed is a mattress in red stil silk with heavy stripes of gold brocade edging it, the day bed. On it lay a woman in black. She was ill with fever. Her daughter was attending her, and we don't need to go into the rest. But here, so out of that, out of that passage, what we take is we have, a, we have a sitter on her day bed in the top floor of the harem, um, and we're where the where where um, where women I suppose were uh, were were, um, were were designated, um, and then Stern later on um, makes the observation that these Arab women of this time were in Purda, um, or Purda um, is I suppose a belief or a custom of um, of Orthodox Islam, 
um, in which the woman can women cannot um, uh, go outside unaccompanied by unaccompanied by either a father or a son um, or a, or a chaperone, and they must be veiled. Um, and so the reading the reading with which I bring to this picture is how precisely did Stern gain entrance into the sanctified space? How did these subject matter, how did these, how did these, how did these subjects feel comfortable enough? And look at the directness in that gaze. There is, uh, there's the, the head slightly tilted down, but I, I believe that there's, there's a deep psychological angst going on between the, between sitter and subject here, where I think unlike, unlike our Swazi woman here, we've got a mutual understanding between between two women, there's a connection where she, I feel as if this this sitter gazes straight out of the picture through Stern and addresses with um, with kind of a vivid honesty um, and an uncompromising honesty um, addresses the sitter as if to say, uh, what are you looking at and who are you looking at, um, you know? And uh, I think it's uh, it's for me for me the gaze in, in this in this work is. Is indeed uh, uh, disarming for its for its directness and its and its honesty. Um, I've just included um, oh, and let's just carry on going here. I've just included some um, other works from this period, just um, as uh, uh, for 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 comparison. Um, and I think um, you'd uh, I would argue that this um, this uh, lady in blue, this is lady this is lady of the harem that was actually illustrated in this in the in the in the Zanzibar book. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Um, and um, and and here we see Stern um, using some of the matting that she spoke about, some of that raffia matting as uh, as frames um, for 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 her for her gouaches. Now, as I said, Stern was a society woman, so you might recognize this um, gentleman. Although I have no categorical proof that uh, he is in fact uh, the sitter in our in our previous uh, in our previous painting. I like to think that uh, this is uh, this is Stern's uh, own rendition of uh, the Sultan of Zanzibar, uh, Saeed bin Saeed Khalifa um, Saeed. Um, but um, again, we have no we have no Stern has left us with nothing. Unfortunately, we have no writing, and we have no direct evidence to say that she was ever um, that she ever did uh, paint a portrait of him. Although she suggests in her writing that she thinks she should. But we don't know um, if she if she ever uh, necessarily manifested that opportunity. So I just ne nevertheless wanted to include some of these pictures, uh, some of these pictures of of the of the the, the the royal family, if you like, of of Zanzibar at the time. And uh, I'll just um, I just want you to to note some of the gazes of the woman that uh, accompanied um, the the Sultan. Here he is. Um, on the, this was, I think, when they were invited to the royal coronation um, of, uh, of, 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 of Queen Elizabeth. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, one of the, one of the quite joyous things um, about these kinds of historical, um, historical reconstructions is that we will never really know. Um, and uh, I suppose it also is calls for, calls for greater research, but I, I believe potentially that um, we, that the gouache that we've been discussing here might be one of these ladies in waiting to the to the sultana um, who was affectionately known as Bibi, um, but uh, but that that remains to be seen. But I think we've got some pretty compelling evidence, uh, and I think uh, you'll notice just in the in the eyes uh, uh, that I think uh, there there is a there is a distinct possibility, and um, so. Nevertheless, it's uh, one of those one of those mysteries that I think adds to the texture of uh, understanding the work. So this this picture was painted in 1945, and I mentioned we're going to go through some very important dates and some some some, some important shifts in Mr. Stern's career. So World War II ends, um, Europe starts to reconstruct, and there's a period of um, renewed, as I mentioned earlier, renewed internationalization um, for both. Europe and indeed for for Stern, and 19 thus 1947 comes along, um, and Stern is is ready to go back. Um, 
the her wunderlust uh, in Africa is exhausted, and um, very often uh, a, a recurring a recurring characteristic of her journeys is that she would return to the same place over and over over again, trying to recreate the magic of the of the first experience. And you know, very often we we read a certain disenchantment and a, dis a disaffection um, uh, on those on those return journeys. So so I think by um, you know which is indicative of her traveling to the Congo twice and went to Zanzibar twice. So uh, here um, we we see. Um, Irma returning to Europe, um, and this perhaps um, was a high watermark uh, in, in, in Irma Stern's life. What we're looking at is the interior shot um, of uh, the, the Wildenstein Gallery or the Gallery de Beaux-Arts um, in Paris. Um, Stern, with the assistance of the South African and French governments, um, sent 113 works to, to Paris um, to mount a career-defining solo exhibition called the uh, Irma Stern Le Painter d'Afrique, um, Irma Stern, the Painter of Africa, um, and which was met with radical critical success. Um, with uh, one of the works being purchased by the French government, um, and uh, which is in the collection today, on, uh, the uh, I think it's on in the collection of the Louvre. Um, and so I just wanted to, and these these works were predominantly from her Zanzibar and uh, Congo periods. Um, and uh, a very, very important, um, a very important um, exhibition because as I said, I think it began to, to open up Stern's um, future possibilities uh, um, uh, for, for, for the direction that her career would uh, take later. So what happens the year later, um, and after this critical success, those 113 works after Paris were then taken to, they were, the, they were broken up and sent um, to London and then to Rotterdam. Um, again, um, with uh, the, Dutch, the Dutch press wasn't particularly enamored with Stern. And Stern, I think, felt that she had arrived. Um, she, you know, with, um, she had shown in Europe before, but never at such a prominent gallery and never with such critical attention. So 1948 comes, 13, the Venice Biennial um, reopens. Um, and, and as I said, this is a period of European reconstruction. This is a period of, um, of, of Europe beginning to redefine its cultural identity on the world stage. Um, Irma in uh, November of 1948 takes a very quick impromptu trip to Italy. Um, and uh, here we can see her we can see her on a on a gondola um, uh, painting furiously the the Grand Canal, and um, and, uh, and 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 she also visited um, uh, visited um, the the Biennial uh, uh, of that year. Now this was this was a, a key moment because she would go on to represent um, to rep to to. Um, exhibits on the South African um, pavilion at the Venice Biennial for in the years of 1950, 1952, 1954, 1956, till then 1958 when she was the features art features artist on the on the South African pavilion, which was again another another high 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 water point. So if we go back to that if we go back to that um, image of. Uh, Stern on the on the gondola. I want you to I want you to keep that. Those of you who have been lucky enough to visit Venice, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because what we're looking at is the um, behind Stern um, is the Doge's Palace, um, and so then surely she must have been looking at this view. Um, she's probably in the you, you know slightly below the 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 um, the the transport um, boats in the in the bottom right hand um, picture. So during during this first trip in 1948, she wasn't exhibiting, but she painted furiously. Um, and this uh, this Grand Canal picture was um, one in a in a series of uh, pictures that she did of the of um, the the entrance of the Grand Canal, um, as well as um, images of San Marco. So the Venetian picture, I suppose, can be. She, she, they, they occupy sort of two territories. Obviously, there's the the one, the one um, is the series of pictures that she would paint with the 
the the canals um, with with bridges um, in the um, you know with the with the characteristic bridges. But then these more the top two pictures are this sort of more enigmatic for me at least um, because they are of the the entrance to the um, um, of the, the Venetian lagoon and the entrance to the Grand Canal. And we can see in the top in the top uh, left hand picture um, the the subject of, uh, of of Stern's picture the Santa Maria della Salute, um, which is this uh, big domed three um, three dome church uh, in the in the in the center of uh, in the center of our of our of our present composition. Um, just out of interest, uh, just so we are 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 are, are, are um, locating ourselves. Um, the the picture where we're looking out across the lagoon um, is uh, presumably painted from from the steps of the Giardini, um, which is where the the which is um, the sort of one of the spiritual homes of the of the of the of the Venice Biennale, and um, then the this 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 next one next to it um, is uh, looking. You can just see the Giardini in the top right hand side. That that the little bit of green. Um, so. These these views are sort of uh, contrasting views across the across the canal, but and then these two two bottom ones um, are, are are images of uh, uh, San Marco uh, San Mark Square. Um, but back to this picture, um, which I I found a lot of joy in researching primarily because of the of the of the the Santa Maria della Salute um, in the in the center of the composition, which is one. Of them, which is one of a series of five votive churches known as the Venetian Plague Churches, um, which uh, seems uh, particularly apt in this day and age. Um, the Venetian Plague Churches um, were uh, the Il Ren, uh, Redentore, um, San Rocco, uh, San Giobbe, and San Sebastiano. Um, now, the this the San, Santa, de, um, Santa Maria della Salute. It translated is um, the Our Lady of Health and Deliverance, um, and the church was um, uh, started in um, 1637 as a result of um, a quite catastrophic plague that um, wiped out a third of the Venetian population in uh, one season, um, and uh, was 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 built to commemorate um, was built by the Venetian state to commemorate the the Virgin Mary and uh, the Virgin. Of uh, the Mother Mary of Deliverance, um, who who rescued uh, 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 Venice from the from the ravages of this uh, ra ravages of this plague, um, and the church itself is very interesting. Interestingly enough, um, uh, Stern also paints the Il Redentore, um, which is, can be seen is this big square church um, in the in the top right hand uh, top right hand side picture um, with the uh, and um, so that's that. I think um, you know, unintentionally, Stern actually painted two of the great Venetian plague churches um, uh, in this in this picture. Um, but I think there's also again, Stern is Stern is um, kind of intrinsically aware of the weight of art history um, uh, on 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 her. And uh, this is the this is the picture of the Il Redentore. And I, I just wanted to be able to um, sort of give you an idea of some of the other, some of the other sort of monumental plague churches. This is San Rocco, and you'll notice they all follow a similar. Well, the the, the more recent ones are, um, uh, all follow a, a similar a similar sort of style of architecture um, uh, for um, you know having these great, great basilica domes. This is uh, this is uh, um, San Giobbe. And then this was, um, uh, oh no, this is San Giobbe, and then this is uh, San Sebastiano, the earliest of the of the plague churches. And you'll notice that uh, the the influence of the Baroque becomes more pronounced as uh, as the as the church is gone. But as I mentioned, um, finally, um, this is the, presumably one of the views of where. So Stern was staying, um, as I mentioned earlier, she was uh, indeed a, a society woman. Um, and so she would stayed probably at the at the finest at the finest location. So this is um, uh, looking out. I think just from the um, Hotel Monaco um, on the on the entrance to the Grand Canal. And Stern would have been painting two floors up, which which accounts for which accounts for the sort of elevated the elevated view 
next to the Punta de la Dogana, um, which houses today the, the, the Pinot collection. You can see it with the big dome on the, on the, on the front. Um, uh, and interestingly enough, as I mentioned, um, finally, Stern, Stern is um, deeply aware of the, of the weight of art history and how can you not be um, in Venice? And so I think when, when, when painting this work, she was um, also owes a debt to, to Canaletto, who painted, uh, who painted this um, remarkable view of the entrance to the, the Grand Canal. And a couple of things, a couple of things um, sort of indicate that Stern had, was definitely aware of this picture, particularly the, the shadows as the lagoon creeps around and as the, that, that illustrate the, the, the depth of the picture um, uh, as, the, as the lagoon um, creeps to the, creeps, uh, creeps around and um, again is that, uh, that sort of interior world of the, um, of, of the Venetian Canal. And again, you can see that retreating, retreating work. But finally, I think um, I would like to, I'd like to end off by, um, by just making my, my, my final observation about this picture is um, that I think it needs to be, uh, its provenance needs to be understood quite particularly in the fact that um, the presence of that Italian flag post-war, right, 1947, is very important, 1948, is very important because I think it speaks about as much as it does of its previous owner, the late Giulio Bertrand, as it does of Irma Stern. If you think about it, Giulio Bertrand was an Italian immigrant buying a picture that I think must have made him incredibly nostalgic for his homeland um, and buying, buying a picture of a South African artist who was uh, thus traveling. So we can see this kind of metaphysical exchange that happens between, uh, between I suppose, subject that was deeply, deeply personal to, to the, um, the late Giulio Bertrand um, and uh, a subject matter that I suppose would, you know, the Venice Biennale is the is the is the center of the art world they call it the olympics of the art world and the, the a place that you know stern would return to for the next 10 years um and so a, a place that was deeply deeply um uh involved in the in in deeply embedded in her heart at the same time so i think this kind of duality between these two these two pictures and indeed biographies um of both previous owner and artist uh, uh, makes a wonderful, makes a wonderful, um, makes a wonderful story and understanding. Thank you very much.